So I'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start since we just started recording. So um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Waterboard Seminar Series. My name is Shupa Rastagarpur, and I'm an environmental scientist. Um, with the state water boards in the Office of Information Management and Analysis. And I am the program coordinator for the SWAMPS Bioassessment Program. So thank you for attending today's seminar. Um, just um, as a reminder, all these seminars are open to the public and recorded um, and posting, and they're posted on the College of Water Informatics um, information webpage. And that link could be distributed um, via email, I think our chat box is disabled um, at this point right now, but we will distribute all the links and associated information um, after this um, seminar. So there's also gonna be a question and answer period at the end of this talk. Um, so please go ahead and hold your questions until today's speaker has uh, finished the presentation. Um, everyone except the speaker is going to be muted um, until this time to just avoid disturbing the talk. And during the Q&A session, we will have, um, a, we'll post a very brief survey via email. So we'll send out an email. I don't know exactly how we're gonna do it since the chat is disabled, unfortunately, but we'll post, uh, we'll send out a survey so that, um, so that you guys can fill it out for us and we can um, review it and make sure that uh, we consider your feedback uh, in order to improve the seminar experience. So with that, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Andy Wren. Andy earned a PhD in entomology from UC Davis in 2000 and has been a biologist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Aquatic Bioassessment Lab, ABL, for the last 21 years. Uh, at ABL, his research has focused on stream ecology with an emphasis on the development of indices that measure the biological and physical condition of streams and rivers throughout California. He has also helped develop standardized field, laboratory, and data management protocols, and he coordinates several regional and statewide stream monitoring surveys. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Andy. Thank you um, for being here with us today. Um, it looks like you're already sharing your screen, so I'll let you take it away. Okay, and you can, you can see it and hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Shuka, for that introduction. And for the invitation to present today. And hello and good afternoon to all the seminar attendees. Today, my plan is to present an overview of the technical elements of the state's bioassessment program. Our lab has been pretty central in the development of that program for the last 20 years or more. And our goal has been to develop the scientific tools and the scientific framework that's necessary to allow measures of ecological integrity to be fully integrated into California's natural resource management programs. Our vision for bioassessment is that California will prioritize bioassessment data to protect and restore its water bodies and watersheds and to evaluate whether certain beneficial uses are being attained, especially those beneficial uses that support the preservation or the enhancement of aquatic habitats. For those of you who might not be super familiar with the science of bioassessment, it's the evaluation of the condition or health of a water body based on the organisms living within it. Bioassessment involves surveying the types and numbers of organisms present in a water body and comparing the results to establish benchmarks of biological health. Traditional water quality monitoring has often focused on measures of individual chemicals at a single point in time, but living organisms are exposed to multiple stressors over time, uh, multiple chemicals, eutrophication, habitat alteration, hydromodification. So their response gives us an integrated picture of the overall ecological condition of a water body. Bioassessment can be used to assess any water body type, uh, but the state's program and our lab in particular have focused on perennial weightable streams. And so that's the habitat type I'll be talking about today. Why stream bioassessment? Well, streams and rivers provide many benefits to humans. They provide us with clean drinking water. 
They provide us with places to fish, places to swim, and they support a diverse and really fascinating uh, native wildlife fauna. So in recognition of and in order to protect those ecological services, Congress in 1972 passed the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. So that's really our, our fundamental mission, is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of California streams. But in order to restore and maintain that biological integrity, we have to be able to measure it, which is actually really challenging in a state like California, given its diverse physiography. The different indicators that we measure at bioassessment sites are benthic macroinvertebrates or BMIs. We also collect algae samples, both diatoms and soft algae. Uh, we measure physical habitat variables and we collect water chemistry samples. I don't have time to talk about all those different indicators in depth today, so I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, benthic macroinvertebrates or BMIs. Benthic macroinvertebrates are organisms that live on the stream bottom. They're usually large enough to see with the naked eye, although you need a microscope to actually identify them to genus and species. Um, they're diverse and abundant. So there can be, you know, from dozens to more than 100 different species present at a site. There can be thousands of individuals per square meter. They have unique preferences for different microhabitats. And they also have different se sensitivities to various kinds of human disturbance. So they're widely used as ecological indicators by monitoring programs all around the world. Examples of sensitive groups are dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. So these are groups that generally tend to decline in numbers and diversity as human disturbance in, the, in a stream or in the upstream watershed increases. By contrast, <clears throat> other groups are able to tolerate or even thrive under degraded conditions. These groups include organisms like amphipods or scuds, uh, segmented worms like leeches and oligochaetes, uh, and snails and midges, which are a type of non-biting fly. So with that broad introduction to BMI-based bioassessment, um, this is an outline of the key components of how we measure and assess biological integrity, which I'll briefly describe in turn today. So first I'll describe our standard field and lab methods and other infrastructure components like data management and quality assurance. I'll talk about our reference condition monitoring program. Um, reference conditions allow us to set benchmarks or expectations and are the core of building interpretive indices for bioassessment data. One of those interpretive indices that we use is the California Stream Condition Index. That's our primary e ecological index that we use in California to measure stream and river health. It's based on BMIs. We also have indices for algae and for physical habitat, but I can't cover them all today, so I'll focus on, on the, the CSCI. And then I'll talk about the Perennial Streams Assessment, or the PSA, which is a statewide survey that allows biological condition estimates for all weightable stream length in California. And then after I present that statewide example, I'll also provide examples of how our indices can be used uh, at regional and site-specific scales. So the first key component of our program is standard field and lab methods. At each bioassessment site, we sample biological, chemical, and physical habitat variables. Uh, so in the upper right of this slide, there's a, a diagram of an example sampling reach. Um, those indicators are, are sampled from a standardized 150 meter long reach divided into 11 equally spaced transects, A through K. There are also 10 intertransects where we take measurements. At each primary transect, we sample BMIs, diatoms and soft algae as biological indicators. We take a water sample at the first transect when we first get to a site, and that sample gets sent to a chemistry lab uh, and gets analyzed for nutrients and other standard, standard analytes like chloride, uh, total suspended solids, and several others. 
And then at each transect, we also measure physical habitat variables like riparian vegetation complexity, in-stream habitat complexity, substrate composition, local riparian disturbance, canopy density, uh, and, and several others. So every site around the state is sampled systematically with equal and consistent effort so we can compare uh, results from streams all around the state. So just to give you a feel for how the bug sampling works, at each transect, we use a D-frame kick net to sample BMIs from one square foot of substrate. We scrub that substrate either with our hands or with our feet, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to, dislodge, to dislodge BMIs into the net. Uh, normally that's a one person job. I'm not quite sure why one person is holding in the net while the other person scrubs the substrate in this photo, but I thought it was a really pretty river. Uh, so I wanted to include it. Um, so in each transect, you collect some bugs, you invariably get some leaf litter and detritus in the sample too. Uh, the material from all 11 transects gets composited into a single sample and preserved in 70% ethanol. That composite sample goes to the bug lab where it gets processed. The first step in processing is washing the sample in a fine sieve to get out the really fine gunk. Um, the sieve is fine enough where none of the bugs get washed out, but you know all the really fine silt gets washed out. Then the sample gets dumped into uh, dumped and uniformly spread out in a gridded tray where just a portion is subsampled and picked for bugs. So a picker, uh, normally a student, um, sits at the scope and picks out all the all the BMIs and leaves the detritus behind. So that picked sample then goes to a taxonomist. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have standard methods both for bugs and algae for how, for how the sample gets washed and prepared for identification. We have methods for how the total sample gets subsampled into the portion that actually gets identified. A taxonomist identifies those, those bugs at the scope to recommended levels of taxonomic identification. That's our standard taxonomic effort. So which, which taxa do you identify the species? Which taxa do you leave at genus? Uh, we also have guidance on what's the best taxonomic literature for identification of the different groups. And then the final result can be seen there in the bottom right picture where all the bugs have been identified and counted um, and each separate taxon gets sorted, sorted and labeled in a separate vial for archiving. All of these methods are well supported and well documented by standard operating procedures. They're well supported by extensive quality control measures. So for example, for both uh, BMIs and algae, we do external QC where a certain percentage of samples from every project are actually sent to a second ta taxonomist <clears throat> for re-identification. Um, and then you know, hopefully the, the identifications from the original taxonomist and the second taxonomist agree pretty well. Uh, we do field audits and calibrations for field crews and the methods are, all, are well supported by online resources. Uh, we have video modules that demonstrate the field protocols, and we have photographic libraries of taxonomic identifications for both uh, BMIs and algae. <clears throat> okay, so the second key component of our program is the reference condition monitoring program. Reference sites are healthy stream reaches that define a benchmark of expected biological, chemical, and physical conditions when human disturbance in the environment is absent or minimal. That benchmark, known as the reference condition, is the foundation of any bioassessment program. It sets the standard for evaluating res results from compliance monitoring and from ambient monitoring. It provides meaningful objectives for stream restoration. It establishes a framework for for protecting our healthiest streams and rivers. And it also provides a basis for assessing potential effects of climate change on streams. So <clears throat> the goal is to compare species living at test sites to those living at reference sites from similar environmental settings. But the challenge is that extreme natural gradients in California result in a really high degree of natural variation in the biological expectations among stream types. Now, I mentioned in my outline a few slides back that 
Reference sites are the core of building interpretive indices for bioassessment data like the CSCI. Over the last 20 years or more, thousands of different sites have been sampled statewide by various uh, uh, federal, regional, state programs. Um, and so to build the CSCI, the first step, step was to screen those sites for reference status. That is, <clears throat> we wanted to establish a network of sites where human disturbance in the environment was absent or minimal. And in addition to screening pre-existing sites, you know, sites that were sampled by whatever program for whatever reason, we've also targeted high quality sites to fill in geographic gaps and to improve representation in the undersampled environmental settings. We mostly use land use characteristics calculated from remote sensing data to screen sites. So for example, uh, the first six metrics there that we use to screen sites are our land use metrics that we calculate at um, three different spatial scales upstream of the site. So we calculate those metrics within one kilometer upstream, five kilometers upstream, and then within the whole watershed. And so for example, for a, a site to pass as a reference site, it has to have less than 3% agricultural land use at all three of those spatial scales. Uh, skipping down the list just a little ways, a site to pass as reference, a site has to have less than two kilometers per kilometer squared of road density at all three of those spatial scales. A site can't have any actively producing mines within five kilometers. Uh, the nearest upstream dam has to be more than 10 kilometers away. Um, we also use data collected by the field crews at the sampling site to screen sites. Uh, so, so sites can also get rejected based on reach scale disturbance. So for example, we have a riparian disturbance index where higher scores uh, indicate greater disturbance. And so for a site to pass as reference, that ri riparian disturbance index has to be less than 1.5. So we have to allow for some upstream disturbance. If our criteria are too strict, we'd only have reference sites in wilderness areas or in the high Sierra where people don't farm or build houses or roads. So the trick is to set criteria that are strict enough that we don't pollute our reference pool with disturbed sites, but the criteria have to be forgiving enough that we have a network of sites that covers that broad physiography present across California. <clears throat> when we applied all those screens uh, to build the CSCI, we ended up with nearly 600 reference sites that had pretty good geographic coverage overall. The table to the left shows how the sites were distributed among different geogra geographic regions. The Sierra was really well represented, uh, the North Coast, Chaparral, and Southern California mountains, a little less so, but still pretty good. We struggled a little bit in lower elevation Southern California, and of course the Central Valley only had one reference site, uh, basically right where the stream flows out of the foothills and onto the valley floor. <clears throat> so in addition to looking at geographic coverage, we also evaluated our coverage in terms of environmental space. So this plot is a principal components analysis or PCA, which is a type of multivariate ordination that clusters sites according to environmental, similar, environmental similarity, natural environmental similarity. So sites that are environmentally similar for natural variables like temperature, precipitation, watershed area, plot close together and sites in different natural environmental settings plot further apart. The big dots are reference sites and the small dots are non-reference. You can see that the big dots are pretty well distributed in environmental space. Um, a couple of, of exceptions are highlighted in the ellipses where, as I said previously, we didn't have great coverage in low elevation Southern California or in the Central Valley. We also looked at whether biological condition at reference sites with some amount of upstream disturbance had lower metric values than sites with zero upstream disturbance. Uh, so these are some example metrics that we evaluated. And I'll, I'll say more about metrics when I actually talk about the CSCI, but metrics are basically ways that we measure um, the composition of uh, a BMI sample. So these are different characteristics of that BMI sample that reflect uh, richness and diversity. 
So the white boxes are reference sites that passed really stringent thresholds where we basically allowed no human disturbance in the upstream watershed. The gray boxes are sites that passed the thresholds I show you, showed you a, a couple of slides ago. And the black boxes are stressed sites that have really high levels of upstream disturbance, um, either you know, high amounts of urbanization or road density or, or both. And so basically the relaxed threshold sites look just like the stringent threshold sites and are clearly better than stress sites. So we were comfortable that our relaxed thresholds didn't pollute our reference pool and that our reference pool represented most environmental settings in California. And then one last point about the reference pool is that it's not static. So since CSCI development, we've screened an additional 800-ish sites for reference status. About 300 of those have passed uh, our screens uh, most of those actually come from probabilistic monitoring, which I'll say more about when I talk about the perennial streams assessment. So now we have a statewide pool of more than 900 sites that does a pretty good job of representing California's diverse physiography. So in the map there at the left, uh, the black dots are the sites we had available to build the CSCI. The white dots are new sites that we've added since. And I just want to note that um, you know, these sites that have been sampled historically previously get revisited um, for, for trend monitoring and to maintain current data sets from as much of that reference network as possible. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about how we sample a stream for BMIs, how that sample gets processed in the lab and the bug identifications get entered into the database. Uh, what species did we collect and how many of each? We talked about how reference sites define expected conditions. And so the question is then, how do we actually score stream condition from a species list? And the answer is uh, the California Stream Condition Index or CSCI, which combines two separate types of indices each of which provides unique information about the biological condition at a stream. There's an observed to expected or O to E index that measures taxonomic completeness and a multi-metric index or MMI that measures ecological structure and function. So first I'll talk about the taxonomic completeness component. Excuse me for a moment. So that's the ODE component. And in this index, we compare the observed number of taxa or O to the expected number of taxa or E. And E here is modeled. The first step in the modeling process was to cluster the reference sites that I just described based on their biological similarity. The cluster analysis resulted in 11 distinct biological clusters or groups which are shown in all those little maps on the left. And um, they're also color-coded in the map to the right. Those groups are not geographically discrete. Uh, that is, you can have sites in close geographic proximity that belong to biologically distinct groups. Then we used a random forest statistical model to associate the biological clusters with natural environmental gradients like latitude, longitude, elevation, climate, uh, that is precipitation and temperature, watershed size, and geology. So some biological clusters are composed of high elevation, cold, wet sites, whereas others are composed of lower elevation, warmer, drier sites. To estimate E, that is the expected number of taxa for a test site, uh, the first step is to estimate the chance of observing each taxon at a test site if the site is healthy. So that is each taxon has a probability of capture or PC. So here I'm using the case making caddis fly genus Ferula as an example. Uh, there's a picture of Ferula in the upper left. You can see them in their, in their cute little cases that they make. So based on our predictor variables, things like climate, geology, watershed area. We use our random forest predictive model to match the test site to each of the biological clusters that also have specific environmental characteristics. So here I'm using, um, pretending there are only four clusters, uh, A, B, C, and D for simplicity. 
So suppose our test site has a 0.5 probability of belonging to cluster A based on its environmental setting. And suppose that Ferula has a frequency of, of occurrence in cluster A of 0.6. That is, it occurs at 60% of the sites in cluster A. Then that cluster's contribution to the probability of observing ferula at the test site is 0.5 times 0.6 equals 0.3, which is so shown there in the far right column, the expected co contribution to the probability of capture. We do that for all the biological clusters. And then we sum the individual probabilities of capture from each reference cluster to get the over, overall probability of observing ferula at the test site if the site is in reference condition. We do that for every taxon in each one of those biologically similar reference clusters. And the sum of those individual capture probabilities is an estimate of the total number of native taxa expected at the site if it's healthy, that's our E. So here, the PC for atherix, which is a type of fly, is 0.7. For betis, which is a mayfly, um, it's 0.92. For ferula, which is the caddisfly example I worked through on the previous slide, it's 0.38. And the sum of all those PCs is 4.07. So that's our E. If the, if the site is in reference condition, we expect 4.07 native taxa to occur at that site. Suppose we actually observe three of those predicted taxa in the sample, when we actually sample the site, then our ODA ratio, ODA e ratio <clears throat> is three divided by 4.07 equals 0.74. So ODA E is scaled from zero to one and it represents the percentage of native assemblage present at a test site. Note that we observed the amphipod genus Hyalella at the site, but it wasn't predicted to occur there. So we don't count it towards O. So a site doesn't get credit uh, for a taxon if it's not predicted to occur there. So that's the ODE component. Now for the ecological structure component, which is the multimetric index or MMI. The, the species list for each site is converted into metrics, which I mentioned previously. Um, metrics are, are measures that represent the taxonomic diversity, the ecosystem function, and uh, the sensitivity to stress of, of the organisms in a sample. So we have richness, richness metrics where we count the number of species in each taxonomic group. For example, we can count how many EPT taxa are in the sample. EPT are mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, those sensitive groups that I mentioned earlier. We can calculate composition measures so what proportion of the sample or what percentage of the sample is composed of EPT relative to other groups. Uh, most taxa have tolerance ratings that indicate their sensitivity to pollution. So we can calculate what proportion of the sample is tolerant or intolerant. And we have functional feeding or trophic measures where we calculate the percentage of different trophic groups like percent shredders or percent collector filters. So when we built the CSCI, we considered 48 common bioassessment metrics uh, for potential inclusion in the MMI. For each metric, <clears throat> we modeled whether it had a significant relationship to natural environmental gradients. So here's a simple bivariate example uh, where we see that the metric percent EPT taxa has a pretty strong positive relationship with elevation. So you tend to get more of them at higher elevations. So in such, in such cases, we took the metric residual, that is the observed value minus the predicted value. And we use that residual as the adjusted metric instead of using the raw metric because the adjusted metrics measure the range of metric variation after removing the effect of natural environmental gradients. So, as I mentioned, this is a simple bivariate example. Our random forest models actually do this for multiple predictive variables all at once. Um, I can't really get my head around it, let alone explain it. So I used a, I used a simple bivariate example just to sort of you know, demonstrate actually what modeling does in the context of adjusting metrics. This plot shows the observed versus predicted values of the metric EPT tax, uh, percent EPT taxa at reference sites. So those are all the little black dots. 
and I've shown two test sites as large red stars. So both of these test sites have 30% EPT tax observed in the sample. So for test site one, that's right at its predicted value. So that site would actually score well for this metric. By contrast, site two also has 30% EPT taxa, but that's way lower than its predicted value. So test site two would score poorly for this metric. So the point is that the score for any given metric depends on how close the test site is to its predicted value, not the actual raw metric value. And I won't say much more about actually scoring metrics today, except to note that scoring is required for, for metrics and for MMIs because individual metrics have different scales. So some are simple counts, some are uh, percentages of the different taxa in a sample, some are you know, the average tolerance value of all the different organisms that were, that were found in the sample. And they have different responses to stress. So as human activity increases uh, at the site or in the upstream watershed, some metrics decrease, whereas others increase. So basically, we have to scale them all from zero to one, where zero is uh, most stressed and one is identical to reference. <clears throat> After scoring, the, uh, the final metrics in the MMI uh, were chosen based on performance attributes. So accuracy and bias uh, that uh, assesses whether the index rates sites the same way in different environmental settings, precision, uh, our index score is repeatable at, uh, at repeat visits to sites, responsiveness, that is, does the index change in relation to stress, and then sensitivity, which is related to responsiveness, but basically assesses whether scores detect change when they should. So the final MMI was then calculated by averaging scores of the select, select, selected metrics and then rescaling or dividing the, those scores by the mean of reference calibration sites. And basically, rescaling the MMI scores ensures that MMI and O to E are expressed in similar uh, scales, that is, as a ratio of observed to expected. And then because they're expressed in similar scales, um, we just average them uh, to get the actual final CSCI score. And that's all there is to it. Okay, so let me try to bring it all home in terms of um, what the CSCI is all about. The CSCI is a statewide biological scoring tool that helps managers and scientists translate complex data about BMIs living in a stream into an overall measure of stream health. The CSCI indicates whether and to what degree a stream is altered from a healthy state. The reason it was important for our reference pool to capture Diverse stream types is because streams vary naturally in the types of organisms that live there. And we don't want to conf confuse that natural variation with human caused disturbance. So, um, kind of starting in the upper left and moving down and then to the right, uh, we use a set of natural environmental predictors, things like elevation, climate, geology, watershed size, and we use statistical models to make site specific predictions of what species and ecological attributes we should see at a site if it's healthy. The site gets sampled, we identify the organisms in the lab, and the CSCI score is a measure of how well a site's observed condition matches its predicted or expected condition. Greater deviations from that expectation indicate a greater likelihood of degradation. CSCI scores range from zero uh, at highly degraded sites to one or even greater than one if sites are equal to reference. There are two components, two component indices in the CSCI uh, shown, shown there to the center right of this slide. There's an index of taxonomic completeness and a multi-metric index of ecological function. So you can see there the, the final six metrics that actually went into the MMI that measures ecological function. If you have a loss of taxonomic completeness, or a loss in any of those six metrics that measure ecological function, you're more likely to get a lowered CSCI score reflecting that loss. The CSCI re responds to human activity. Uh, sites with high activity, like lots of urbanization or road density, 
uh, tend to have much lower CSCI scores than reference sites and intermediate sites are somewhere in between. We can also look at responsiveness across continuous stressor gradients. So here we see that O to E in the top three panels, MMI in the middle three panels, and uh, CSCI in the bottom three panels all decrease as development in the watershed, riparian activity, and percent sand and fine substrate increase. The black symbols and black or sorry, the uh, black symbols and solid lines in these plots are linear regressions for our predictive indices. And the gray symbols and dashed lines are regressions for null or unmodeled indices. And this basically shows that the unmodeled indices have steeper slopes or a slightly stronger response than modeled indices because part of that response is to natural gradients that co-vary with stressor gradients. So you can see how modeling removes or at least reduces response to natural gradients. And so the response that's left is a response to human disturbance gradients. Here we see that the CSCI doesn't show bias among major ecoregions in the state. That is scores at reference sites tend to center on one in all, in all regions. That's a good thing. <clears throat> And then finally, we use the distribution of scores at reference sites to define condition categories for all sites. Uh, so I should note um, that the CSCI was calibrated so that the mean score at reference sites was one. And so this shows the distribution of scores across all reference sites. If a site scores as good as, good at or better than the 30th percentile of reference sites, we say that site is likely intact or likely to be in good biological condition. The threshold we use to draw the line in the sand between impaired and not impaired biological condition is the 10th percentile of the reference distribution, uh, which is a score of 0.79 and defines the boundary between the possibly altered and likely altered condition categories. And then we also have a condition category uh, for very likely altered um, for sites that score uh, as, as bad as or worse than the first percentile of reference sites. So some final key points about the CSCI um, before we move on to how we actually use these indices in statewide and regional assessments. Our modeled indices, whether ODE or MMI, have better performance characteristics than unmodeled or null indices. That is, they have better accuracy and precision, lower bias, less responsiveness, responsiveness to natural gradients, but strong responsiveness to disturbance gradients. And the second point is actually kind of a, a builds on the first point for MMI, modeled metrics, that is the metric residuals, provide a more accurate evaluation of metric response to human disturbance gradients because they factor out the effects of variation across natural environmental gradients. And then probably the most important point is that the expected CSCI score for any given assessment site is site specific, depending on its environmental setting. And this was, this was an improvement over uh, traditional MMIs that we had built in the past, which used broad landscape classifications like North Coast versus South Coast um, that really only partially controlled for natural vari variation and biological metrics. So basically, you know, a, a stream in the North Coast, a test site in the North Coast, ha all had kind of a one size fits all reference expectation. So the CSCI is an improvement because it provides that site specific expectation depending on a site's uh, specific environmental setting. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've covered um, the CSCI, as an example of one of the indices that we use to interpret bioassessment data and some of the programmatic elements that, that underlie it, let's shift gears to how we actually use the index in statewide and regional assessments. The first example is the Perennial Streams Assessment, or PSA. The PSA is a statewide survey where sampling sites are selected according to probabilistic or random survey design. Each random site represents a known portion of the total stream length. That is, each site has a statistical weight. Um, the random survey design 
uh, allows assessment of the entire resource of interest with relatively limited sampling effort. And these, these probabilistic surveys work similarly to political or opinion polls. The PSA survey allows us to provide objective answers to several core questions with known statistical precision. Those main questions are, what is the biological condition of California streams? Is that condition getting better or worse over time? How does condition differ among streams draining agricultural, urban, and forested watersheds? And what chemical and physical stressors have the strongest association with biological condition? I really only have time to address that first question today. Um, what is the biological condition of California streams? Our most recent assessment, which was finalized in March of this year, included data from upwards of 1,900 unique sites that were sampled between 2008 and 2018 by uh, the PSA and, and five different partner surveys that were, that were more regional probabilistic surveys. Um, we report the results at both the statewide scale and also by subregion. So you can see there to the left in the map at the left, those are the different subregions that we use as reporting units. Uh, this was the first time that we actually used multiple indices in the assessment. So the biological ind indices we used were the CSCI and the algal stream condition index or ASCII. Uh, the physical indices were the index of physical integrity and the California Rapid Assessment Method, which also fo uh, focuses on physical habitat, um, but it also measures land use at a pretty local scale relative to the assessment area. Now, it's hard to show a map of results with all the sites uh, coded by condition for, for four different indices at the, time, uh, at the same time. So I'll just show you the results for CSCI since, that the, since that's the index we've mostly been focusing on today. So in this map, um, the green dots and the green slices in the pies in the pie charts are sites that are likely intact. The yellow dots and yellow slices are sites that are possibly altered. Orange dots and orange slices are likely altered sites. And then red dots and red slices are very likely altered sites. On average, nearly half the stream length in the state was in likely intact condition, or that, that's the best ecological condition according to CSCI. Um, but conditions varied quite a bit by region. So for example, the North Coast and the Sierra both had more, more than half of their stream length in likely intact condition, whereas the Central Valley basically had no stream length in likely intact condition. And then the other regions were somewhere in between. We did want to present results for all four indices side by side, so we used bar charts for that. So the, the top panel in this slide uh, shows the condition assessment for the state as a whole. The y-axis shows the percent of stream length in the different condition categories. Um, and, the, and then the four different indices are lined up along the x-axis. So from left to right, it's the CSCI, ASCII, IPI, and CRAM. Um, and then the bottom panel shows the results broken out by those subregions. The results were fairly similar among the indices, uh, with the Sierra and the North Coast being in the best condition, uh, the Valley being in the worst condition, and then the other regions being somewhere in between. <clears throat> so that's how we assess stream condition at statewide and regional scales using a probabilistic design. But now I want to focus a little more on the regional scale. Um, where bioassessment sites are, off, are often targeted uh, for monitoring by regional boards because they have known impacts from environmental stressors, either on aquatic life use or water quality or physical habitat or some combination of those. Those, those targeted sites, those problem sites, are often the target of management actions directed at improving those environmental conditions. So it's useful to compare the ecological condition at targeted sites to the average regional condition as estimated from probabilistic surveys and to regional reference condition conditions. And that allows the, the magnitude of ecological impacts at targeted sites 
to be quantified relative to the region as a whole and helps us to know whether our management actions are working over time. So <clears throat> in the Lahontan region, uh, we recently helped the regional board address that question. How does stream condi condition at bioassessment sites targeted for sampling uh, by the Lahontan board compare to the regional average and to regional reference conditions. We used ANOVA or analysis of variance to compare means between probabilistic reference and targeted distributions. Uh, the Lahontan region is in pretty good shape ecologically compared to most other regions. I mean, that makes sense. We go to the mountains for clean air, clean water and fresh powder, right? Um, so for many of the variables that we evaluated, uh, they didn't show significant differences between those distributions. So I'll just show you the ones that did. So for CSCI, uh, which is shown in the upper left set of box plots, probabilistic and targeted sites both had significantly lower means than reference sites. For the riparian in disturbance index in the upper right set of box plots, targeted sites had a significantly higher mean than reference sites. And remember, higher scores for that index uh, are worse, uh, reflect more disturbance. And then in the bottom three plots, uh, total nitrogen, ammonia, and alkalinity, um, which are actually probably autocorrelated, uh, targeted sites had significantly higher means than both probabilistic and reference sites. The Lahontan board actually found these comparisons to be really informative. Uh, they've never looked at their data in this, way in this way before. And that perspective in conjunction with a regional probabilistic assessment, which we did for them, and which was similar to the statewide assessment that I showed you in the previous slides, um, are actually helping them plan their bioassessment sampling over the next few years. And then finally, this is an example of how we can use comparisons between targeted probabilistic and reference distributions to help inter interpret progress at a site-specific scale. So this example is from the Central Coast, where we see the reference distribution of riparian disturbance index scores is skewed to the left and centered at scores less than one, indicating minimal disturbance. Uh, the prob probabilistic distribution uh, shows that the average condition in the region is not quite as good as at reference sites. That distribution is, is somewhat shifted to the right and the right tail skews out uh, towards higher scores. And then at targeted sites, um, which again are often sampled because they have known issues, um, are skewed far to the right, indicating that they're much more disturbed, not only in comparison to reference sites, but also compared to typical sites in the region. So if we think about recovery tra trajectories, suppose we begin a restoration at one of these targeted sites where the riparian disturbance score is a three. Maybe that restoration improves the score over time to a two or one whole unit, uh, which is good, but it's still in worse condition than most probabilistic sites. And it's still in poorer condition than pretty much all the reference sites. Now, maybe it's not possible to rehabilitate that site fully back to a reference state, um, for example, because of upstream land use constraints. Maybe it's a highly urbanized uh, site. But if we're at least trying to get it back to a condition that's on par with the regional average, maybe a score closer to one might be an appropriate restoration target. In any case, we encourage managers to consider the magnitude of ecological impacts at targeted sites relative to the region as a whole to set restoration targets and evaluate whether those goals are being achieved. And so then in conclusion, California's bioassessment program is one of the most developed in the country. Our indices, not only our biological indices, but also our physical habitat indices represent the best available science and years of investment. And I'm not saying there's no room for improvement, but compared to many, if not most other states, they're actually pretty advanced. Um, we need your help though, to get them more fully adopted as assessment methods and scoring tools. The use of multiple indices together 
to infer the e ecological condition of streams, uh, each, each of the indices being based on either different taxonomic assemblages or data types, uh, can greatly strengthen our confidence in results from bioassessment surveys. Uh, they reduce the likelihood of incorrect conclusions from sampling error or natural variability, and they improve our ability to diagnose causes of degrada degradation. So if you have multiple indices at a site that all agree about the site's condition, that greatly strengthens our, con our confidence in that assessment. By contrast, if the indices disagree, we can actually take advantage of their different sensitivities to different stressors to help diagnose what the cause of degradation might be. And then finally, comparing the distribution of index scores at targeted sites, which again are often sampled because they have known problems, uh, to scores at probabilistic sites and reference sites helps us to quantify the magnitude of ecological impacts at targeted sites and helps us to allow, um, helps us to know uh, whether our management actions are working over time. And then finally, I just want to point out that there are lots of resources available um, if you want more information on any of these topics. Uh, so the Swamp Bioassessment webpage link is, is listed first there. Um, there are lots of different uh, resources posted on, on that website. Uh, the latest ecological assessment, the perennial streams assessment report is posted there. Um, you can also find more information about the physical habitat index, which I didn't say much about today, but there's a technical memo posted that explains how we develop that index. And there's um, an example of how we use multiple biological and habitat indices for bioassessment in California streams. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and I hope you found the talk uh, informative and enjoyable. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Andy. So we're gonna open it up to questions. Uh, we have a little less than 10 minutes. Um, unfortunately, our Q&A chat box option um, is not available. So if there are those of you who'd like to ask a question, um, if you just hover to the bottom of your screen, there should be a raise hand button. Um, and so you can select that. And so we can um, give you permissions to um, ask your question um, verbally. We can unmute you um, after you um, select to raise your hand. So if you have any questions for Andy, now's the time to ask away. Um, I think, I feel like I, oh, there is one. Yeah, we have a hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Okay. So what other work are you doing with the boards to um, inform them of how to like make their bioassessment um, capabilities more robust? You mentioned the Lahotan board. Um, right, so we had never really done um, a regional assessment specific to the Lahontan board previously. So um, we took a subset of the, the probabilistic data that I showed you, um, you know, that was specific to their region and actually worked up an assessment just for their, their region um, to, to help them uh, understand their targeted data in the context of, of probability data a little better. Um, and like I said that, you know, they were actually able to take that information and use it to inform their sampling strategy over the, the medium term future, the next you know, three to five years. Will you be doing more work for the, uh, for the other regional boards or is it just like, that's it? <laughs> no, no, we, I mean, yeah, we try to help all the regional boards as, as much as we can. Right, thank you, um, Robo, is it? I think um, if you don't have any more follow-up questions, um, I'll go ahead and lower your hand. Um, if there are any other questions, you can go ahead and raise your hand like I mentioned before. I can go ahead um, and ask a question for you, Andy, uh, while we wait for um, a couple questions. So um, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about like how reference sites could be used 
um, potentially to assess impacts from climate change. I thought maybe it would be interesting to kind of go into that a little bit. Sure. So the, the main thing is to just like track what that distribution looks like over time. So I showed a slide uh, in the middle of the talk. So when I was talking about the performance of the CSCI, where I showed how the, the scores at reference sites across all the different regions centered at one. So the, the CSCI is calibrated so reference sites score at one or the mean of reference sites scores at one. And so we saw those distributions centered at one across you know, uh, the Sierra, the North Coast, Central Coast, et cetera. So basically, if we track that over time and that distribution starts to shift downward consistently, um, then we know, you know, then we know that there's an overall decreasing trend in reference sites over time. And if we can re relate that to um, climate data, temperature and precipitation, that would be a good indicator that our the reference condition is actually degrading in response to climate change. In which case, it would probably be time to actually recalibrate the index. Does that help? Does that make make sense? I was about to speak, but I forgot to unmute. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that's good. Um, We've actually done that. Um, you know, I've, I haven't really presented those result, results. Um, they're kind of just living on my computer. But we've, you know, we've been tracking that reference condition over time in different regions. We haven't really seen a de decrease yet. I mean, it's pretty tight in the Sierra. It's a little bit squirrely in the Chaparral. Um, but no, no really, you know, consistent decrease in condition over time yet. Yeah, I was, I was asking because we, I mean, the governor announced, I mean, after or right before we had like a 24 hour rain period, but just being officially in a drought, it would be interesting to just kind of track the different iterations of drought periods that we've had over the course of decades and seeing how fluctuations of impacts of the TAD on um, biologically, I guess, sewer streams. Right. Um, let's see. I don't see I don't think there are any other questions. Um, OK, well, um, this is definitely um, open for if you have any follow-up questions um, for any of the attendees, um, if you have any follow-up questions, um, you know, I can always distribute Andy's contact information if you're open to that, Andy, or you can just go ahead and email the swamp email um, that Amy, or Andy had at the end, um, at the bottom of his screen. Um, unfortunately, we can't email out all of the resources and the contact information through the chat box because we don't have the chat enabled here right now. So we can email that information out later. But um, I wanted to thank um, Andy and for all you attendees for participating in today's seminar. Um, just wanted to go ahead and um, let everyone know that this is a recorded seminar um, recording. So um, it will be posted on this event's portion um, on the College of Water Informatics events webpage. So um, if you need um, a direct link to where that events webpage is, again, we'll try to distribute all that information out to you so that it's gonna be available for you to revisit um, today's talk and, um, and to also check out other recordings of other talks that we've had um, throughout the last year. Uh, my impression is, is that this is the last um, webinar series that we have for this year. And um, thank you again, Andy, for, um, for today's talk. And if there are any questions from the attendees, you guys wanted to raise your hands if there's any last minute questions, um, we can go ahead um, and adjourn. So thank you, everyone. This was great. Thanks, Shuka. Yeah. Thank you, Shuka. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Devin. Thank hmm. everybody. All right, uh, we'll have this uh, recording posted and I do have everyone's emails, so I will send out all the links that Shuka was referring to. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Thank Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.